Hi, good morning. Okay, well, I'm going to hand it off to you now, Jesse. Looking so forward to this presentation. Thank you and go forth. Let's do it. Awesome. Thank you so much. I am so, so excited to be here talking about this. Um, I really recently, probably in the last six months, learned about polarity maps, which is what we're going to be investigating today. Um, and I found it such a really useful way to think about some of these really, really tough problems that we face. Um, so I'm going to actually be walking you through a tool that you can use to uh, to help manage um, issues that you have in your life, in your work, whatever you do. Um, so that's why I've called it a polarity experience, um, because not only will you be doing an activity related to this at the end, um, also, I'm really hoping that you will participate a lot um, throughout the presentation. So there's going to be lots of opportunities for you to share your ideas, um, and we're really going to be working together on this. Um, so put your participation hat on, and we're going to have hopefully some fun. So our first fun question is, what is a wicked problem. So you either know this or you're like, what the heck is she talking about? So I thought it would be fun to just kind of brainstorm a little bit. When you hear wicked problem, what what comes to mind? What is uh, what's the first thing you think of? Uh, some of you were ready with that enter button. I love it. I love it. Uh, problem with multiple facets with no clear solution, complex. <laughs> Somebody says Boston. I, I feel that there's a, a story there that I, I want to know about. Um, multiple root causes. Sticky problems, right? That's another really evocative word. Unsolvable. Snowball. So I... I I'm hearing snowball and thinking of a problem that just seems to gather momentum and gather more pieces and that will really knock you down <laughs> if you get in the way. Systemic, yes. And somebody is totally anticipating my entire presentation, cannot be solved because two opposing forces are intention. So yes, and that is what we are going to be talking about. Um, and we have also a, a wicked problem solving world hunger, which is a great example of a wicked problem. So a lot of wicked problems have at their core um, something called VUCA. So this is a way of looking at the world that we're currently in that makes it really clear that it's really not the world that we used to live in. Now, thinking back, from my perspective, the world's always been kind of like this, but I think we're more aware of it now because of things like the pandemic and, you know, all of the, the complexity that we face with the challenges in our country and the different perspectives we have on all of those challenges. So I think it's really in our awareness right now. Uh, so VUCA is a really great acronym for this, and it stands for volatility. So that means that things can change rapidly. Um, there's not space between the changes for us to always um, keep track of what's happening. And I just realized that I meant to uh, link the learner guide in the chat, um, and I did not. So if you haven't downloaded it, um, we'll get, I, it looks like I can't, I, I can't link it link. earlier. Uh, you did. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, that's great. Um, I have, yeah, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. So just real fast to let the group know, slides that uh, Jesse put together are so awesome and visual, but she also put together um, a PDF with these same visuals, but notes to follow along. So if folks like the notes, uh, that is linked in the chat. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Talia. And thank you. We did a, we did a lot of work to try to combine my my presenting style with what what you all needed. So um, so thank you so much for Talia for helping out with that. Um, okay, back to VUCA. So we have volatility. Then next we have uncertainty. So uncertainty is really connected to volatility, right? It means that you you can't necessarily look at the trajectory uh, from where we are, where we've been in the past and project the future, right? Because we've got disruptive events happening on a regular basis. So we can think, okay, in six months, this is what might happen. And we can be totally disrupted and, and it could be something totally different. And then it's complexity. So if you look at the little uh, diagram, if you can, uh, the, it's a it's a little um, a bunch of dots kind of all connected together. So complexity, a big piece of this is that every single problem that's a wicked problem is connected to all other problems. I mean, not all, but you know, you know, you get the you get the you get the drift. So thinking about world hunger, for example, that is connected to poverty, which is connected to how we manage politics between rich nations and poor nations. So all of these things are connected, which makes it difficult to separate out one problem and say, okay, we're gonna solve this problem. And lastly, it's ambiguous. So that means that we can't even define what we're looking at many, many in many instances. So you're trying to see a problem and there might be no edges. Um, there, you know, there, it's bleeding into everything else. So from this kind of VUCA acronym, um, we come up with these. So, so there's actually a lot of work that's been done on wicked problems. And if you go in, and Google it and you look up, you're going to find many different definitions and many different sets of um, sets of characteristics. So this one is really simple because it can be applied across the board. It's not, you know, there's some that are sets of 10 characteristics and they get quite specific. Um, so I think this one is a really good one uh, because it also ties back into this VUCA. So it's uncertain, ambiguous, and complex. Um, one of the pieces of ambiguity that I didn't mention before is different points of view. So I'm sure we have all experienced this in our country and world that we have these really intractable problems that people have really different points of view on. And one of the beautiful things about the process we're going to be learning today is that it takes that into account and allows us to harvest the best of both perspectives. So a wicked problem is different from a regular problem in these three characteristics and in the fact that a, a problem, like a simple problem, can have a right or a best answer. So take, for example, you want to have a new, um, a new software system for your agency. In some ways, that is a wicked problem, right, because it, it's going to impact a lot of other things. Um, but it also has a solution. You might not be able to pick the 100% best solution for everybody, but once there's a solution, then that problem is solved. You have the software. Of course, depending on the software, it may mean you'll have a whole bunch of other problems, um, but that's it's still not that not crossing the line into that wicked arena. So we have many problems in our world that come under the heading of wicked problems. So I'm going to go through a couple that are kind of worldwide. And I'm sure as you're thinking about this, you'll be able to see uh, problems that you're facing in your work or in your life that are smaller, but that are also wicked problems. So it doesn't necessarily have to be like a worldwide problem in order to be a wicked problem. So we have environmental degradation, financial volatility, poverty, education. 
these are all, I mean, I, I'm sure even just looking at them, you can see, well, these are all connected, right? So solving one of them involves impacting others. So that, that's a huge piece of, um, of what a wicked problem is. The other key characteristic, with someone, which someone mentioned in the beginning, is that many wicked problems are based around uh, what we could say are uh, incompatible concepts or seemingly incompatible concepts. Uh, so we might find ourselves trying to choose between two alternatives and not being able to really stick with either one. So a, a really great example of this is um, stability and change, right? Um, I'm sure that many of you have experienced uh, in your agency or elsewhere that uh, you can have stability for a really long time and then things get stagnant, stagnant, right? You're working with maybe a broken system that hasn't been updated. And then suddenly everything's changing and it feels chaotic and it feels out of control. So the process we're gonna be walking through is a way to balance those two alternatives. Um, so I'm curious, what other, uh, what other contradictory poles do you see in your work, in your world that that make it difficult to uh, to make progress? So if you just want to drop that in chat. So what 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 contradictory alternatives do you work with in your lives? Uh, flexibility versus having clear rules. Yes, for sure. Freedom versus control. Needing to improve processes and needing to analyze processes, right? You can get stuck either in choosing an alternative quickly or getting stuck in analysis paralysis. a matrix model and a federated model, human focused, institution focus. Yes, these are all um, great examples of what, uh, what, we're, what, we're, what we're thinking about. So when you see these arising, it's really easy to get into a tug of war. Right. So you have some people that are really for one pole and some one side and some people that are really on the other side. Um, or it could be the same person. I, I don't this is a problem I have where I'm like, well, this makes a lot of sense. But but wait, this makes sense, too. We have to do both of these things that I don't I, it's, it gets confusing. Um, so just looking at this image, uh, just imagine that one of these teams wins. So they are successful in pulling away the rope. What's going to happen to the kids? What will happen to them? Just in a very concrete way. Just drop that in the chat. What's going to happen if one team wins? Flat. <laughs> I love it. Landing in the mud, right? Yeah, the other team loses. Someone's going to get dirty, right? This is, we're not talking an ideal solution here, are we? Like, you know, there's probably going to be crying, it's not a win-win, so someone's gonna get muddy, right? And, and like in my imagination, they actually both get muddy because if you're pulling on a rope and the other team lets go, what happens to you, right? You're, uh, you're out of balance, you're falling down too. So you, you really don't necessarily feel even like a winner because you're also going splat. So it's, it's really not, you know, that's not where we want to be, it's not where I want to be. And we can see this happening a lot in our world, right, where we swing to one side and everything goes splat. So think about environmental degradation for a minute and think about what might be some competing concepts, competing ideas at the heart of this problem, of solving this problem. Um, I have a couple of examples and I'd like to see first what you all can come up with. What are the 
Yeah, okay, we've got one already. Individual responsibility versus government responsibility. What else do we see that's at the heart of this? I'm sorry, there's a garbage truck going outside outside of my window. Um, global versus local. Yeah, right. Do we protect our little piece of land or the whole world? Economic growth versus resources. Um, so we have one in here that is a, a really great example. So hydroelectricity versus salmon. Yes. So I, I, I would invite you to think a little deeper into that polarity because yes, those are two things that are hydroelectricity and salmon have difficulty coexisting, but what is the, what is the, the deeper polarity underneath that? Um, security versus self-determination, people versus profit, now versus future. Yes, you've identified so many of these. Um, so here's here's the ones I, I think you may have come up with all the same ones I did. So I've got self-interest versus the common good. Continuity versus change. Short-term versus long-term. So when we think about this, if we stay stuck in this place where we're this versus this, this versus this, are we ever going to solve this problem? Um, I think probably not, but we need to because we want to build a world that we can love, right? That we can all love and be a part of. So that's what I'd like us to think about right now for the last half of this presentation. You can use your phone. This is my first time trying this, so hopefully it will work uh, to scan that QR code and then enter in. Like if you think about the world you want, just share one word about what is the world that you wanna live in? What are its characteristics? Well, let's try this. I'm really hoping it will work. <laughs> Oh my goodness, I'm loving this so much. Sustainable, peaceful, forgiveness, secure, honest, empathic, sustainable. They're going too fast. <laughs> so many really, really lovely words here. I'm just going to give us a second to just kind of enjoy these coming in. Mm, symbiotic. Yeah, I, I love that word. It's such a great word of like, you know, everything. I mean, what I imagine is sort of everything being its best self and and working together. Caring, generous. I love it. Thank you so much for sharing those. And feel free to continue because I can share out the final image. So if you think if I go to the next slide and you think of something else, just add it in. Um, so what I would like us to do is to hold that, like hold this vision in your mind as we kind of go through the rest of this presentation, because everything that we're going to do, this whole polarity map, all of it is aimed at this right? This is the result that we're looking for. So let's take a look at this slide again. And let's just, we're just going to switch one word out of this and see what happens. So what if we said, we're going to consider self-interest and the common good. We're going to consider continuity and we're consider we're going to consider change. We're going to consider the short term and the long term. So just that tiny little word. When I hear that, it like it kind of gives me shivers actually because I'm like that is such a different framing. And when you're talking to somebody who has a different point of view, it's a different framing. How can we have, you know, both of the things that we need? So the the really important piece of a polarity. Um, so we're so these are polarities rather than um, competing concepts. 
the thing about polarities is both ends have important positive impacts, right? So, so for example, like, like, um, good and evil, not a polarity, because one is not preferred, right? It's if there's a, a an obvious choice between the two concepts, then, um, then that's not a polarity. The one caution around that, however, is that often, particularly if we're talking to somebody with whom we don't agree, um, often we hear the surface of what they're saying. We hear the the we hear the piece that we don't like, but we don't hear the deeper desire. So we might be somebody who's comfortable ch with change, for example, and so we. Uh, we want to dive into this new thing. And another person is being really negative about it, right? In our perspective, we just think, well, they, they are, what they want to do is just terrible. Sometimes if you dig down deeper, like maybe what they're really, they're, the real value that they're expressing is we've done a lot of good work so far and I don't want to lose it. So it's really important to not use this idea of, um, polarities versus contradictions to put people in the contradiction category when they're not really there. Um, this was kind of a tricky, uh, tricky idea, but um, it's an important piece of it. Um, so what we're going to look at now is a polarity map. So this is a way of analyzing a polarity that gives us a uh, the results that that we need from both sides. So the goal is to leverage the positive consequences of each polarity. Um, so uh, so I didn't put alt text in this because I'm going to describe it really quickly. Uh, so in the center, we have a table with four uh, four quadrants. Um, the upper two, are marked benefits and the bottom two are marked unintended consequences. Um, each column would have a different polarity at its heart. So the example I've used here is learning and building. So do we wanna learn more and more and more or do we wanna build a solution? So that would be one polarity you could look at. Um, at the very top is the outcome we want. So where are we trying to go? If everything goes right, what 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 are we gonna what are we gonna see? Um, the opposite is the outcome that we don't want at the bottom. So if we slip down into those unintended consequences, that's what we're gonna get. Uh, so there are two columns on the edges of this center table. The the top one is action steps, and those are how are we what are we gonna do specifically to leverage the benefits of each polarity. Down at the bottom are early warnings. So that is what is going to tell us, like what is the first thing that's going to happen uh, to let us know that we're slipping into the unintended consequences. Uh, so what we're gonna do for the rest of this, um, the presentation piece, sorry, I was looking for my clock, um, is we're going to walk through an example quickly of what this might look like from start to finish. We're going to pick a, a relatively simple one. <laughs> you can tell me later if uh, if that is if it, if it was really simple. Uh, so let's say we have a goal to run a marathon. We really want to we really want to run a marathon um, and we're just about to start training. Um, so we recognize uh, one of the polarities at the heart of training for a marathon is rest versus activity, right? We, we obviously need to have some activity because we're going to have to run and run and run and run a lot. We might do weight training. There's lots of things that we could do to prepare. And we also need to rest, right? Because you can't only have activity, um, so we're just going to kind of walk through the quadrants and brainstorm a little bit what might be the um, the benef benefits, action steps, and un unintended consequences of rest and activity. So let's take let's take rest first. What are the benefits of rest? Go ahead and just drop some in the chat. What are some benefits of rest? Rejuvenation, yeah, we get our energy back. Healing, recovery, 
We get to pet animals, yes. <laughs> Mental clarity, processing, dreaming, reset glycogen levels. I, if somebody who may have trained for a marathon. <laughs> we have time to reflect on our progress. It keeps us in an open-minded. It resets our nervous system. Lots of, lots of benefits of rest. Um, okay, so let's look now at activity. <laughs> less sassy. Yes, I feel that. What are the benefits of activity? So thinking about running a marathon, what is activity going to do for us? How is activity going to help us meet our goal of running the marathon? We're going to get endorphins, right? It's going to make us want to continue. We're going to build our endur endurance. We're going to have mental clarity so we can train properly and increase our lung capacity, our stamina, increase our fitness level, long-term health, right? It's not just about running the marathon. We're going to be doing it for, for a long time. Uh, although I can say that running running 13 miles in a stretch is not always, <laughs> not you don't always feel totally happy after doing that. Um, community building, right? We might be running with other people. Yeah, a smile inducer from those endorphins. Um, okay, so let's move on to unintended consequences. So say we uh, we focus on rest a lot, like we're focusing on rest a lot. We're not really doing much activity. What is that going to do to our chances of completing a marathon? How is that going to impact us? Lethargy. We're not spending time to train. We're not going to build our endurance. What's, you know, what's going to happen the day of the marathon? We're not going to make it. Our muscles will atrophy. Yeah, we're not going to be paying attention to our nutrition. So we're probably not going to get the, um, get the, the right nutrition. We're going to have self-doubt, right? Because we're going to be, we're going to be aware that we don't have, that we don't have the stamina and the, and the fitness. Um, lack of motivation. Yeah. Right. Um, okay, so let's let's switch to the other poll. Let's say we spend a lot of time uh, in activity. We're not really paying attention to our rest. What is going to happen to our marathon training? Burnout. We're going to overtrain and injure ourselves. We're going to be exhausted. We're going to have heart, joint, and muscle issues. We're not going to be balanced. Maybe we'll like never see our family or our friends. <laughs> injury, injury, injury. Yes. What are, what are our chances of making it to the end of that marathon if all we did was activity? All right. So now this is where it gets interesting. We're going to look at some action steps. So how can you make sure you're leveraging the positive benefits of rest? So those things that we talked about, what, what are some concrete actions you could take to, uh, to make sure that you have the benefit? Plan, right. Educate yourself on, on, on how to rest appropriately. Stick to a sleep schedule. Build a support network. Hire a coach, accountability partner. And you'll notice that some of these are going to work for both both sides, right? So the things that that help you might that help you leverage rest, some of them might be the same as what help help what's going to help you um, leverage activity. Sleep hygiene. <laughs> Your smartwatch will tell you to rest. Yes. Uh, yes, sometimes they can be a little demanding. <laughs> That's great. Okay, so now let's turn to the activity poll. What are some action steps you can take to leverage the positive benefits of activity? Plan again, right? Yes. <laughs> so this is where your marathon training plan comes in. It's looking at um, how much time do I need to rest? How much time do I be act active? Join a club or group. Right. Some people need that buddy, accountability partner. Build in an incentive. Yeah. 
um, set clear goals, right? So like you want to be able to run a, um, in, a in a certain time, a certain, you know, sprints or, or whatever you're doing. Set SMART goals, pay attention to your nutrition. Pace goals, yes. Awesome. So, so many things we can do to leverage activity. Um, so then the, the, the other really, really key piece is, and this was kind of, I think, a mental game changer for me um, that I'm still really trying to integrate. And that is your warning signs. So these are like your, your first indication that something is going wrong, that you're shifting too much to one pole. So think about rest. Okay, what are your what would what could your early warnings be that you're focusing too much on the rest pull in your marathon training? Community concern. Maybe your um, maybe your your accountability buddy says, "Hey, I haven't seen you on any runs." Loss of stamina, weight gain. Okay, so let's um, let's dial it. Let's see if we can think of something that's measurable that will tell us we're getting too much rest. So as an example, it could be um, you missed two workouts in a row. Um, slower running speed, right. Okay, your, your run time goes down. So question, how would you know that that was from rest and not from overtraining? So you might want, it might maybe think of frequency goes down, your frequency of your running. Um, I find these the most challenging because I think we're not necessarily used to thinking in that. Um, if you can come up with something that's, that's measurable, um, that's, um, Difficulty falling or staying asleep or sleeping too many hours, right? So say, say you, if you sleep over 10 hours, then, then that's a warning sign that something's gone wrong. Um, so you want these like really as concrete of cues as you can get uh, to, if something is, you know, to um, that first because you you don't want it to escalate, right? So you want to think back to like, what is the first thing I'm going to notice that's really concrete? Yes, times you woke up during the night, average time to fall asleep. Yes, those are some great, um, uh, great ideas. What about warning signs that you are spending too much time on the activity? And you'll notice that some of them are the same. Um, of what you've been uh, saying. So for example, your your speed, right? That could be a warning sign of sleep or overtraining. I mean, of, of too much rest or too much overtraining. Um, so it's, it's, it's really good to see if you can think of something that is applicable only to one. Um, okay, so we've got fatigue, over, cramps, injury, your shoes wear out. <laughs> um, yeah, increasing mileage more than five to 10% per week. So that's, yes, that's a, that is extremely concrete that you can do. Um, so I, I would invite you to think about something like injury. Um, because I, I would, I would consider injury to be not a necessarily an early warning, but that's more of like a stoppage, right? Like you literally can't continue. So we're trying to avoid getting to that point. Um, so what is your first indication? So for example, I have, when I run my right foot, if I run too much, starts to get some pain right under my arch. So for me, that's an early warning. It's like, okay, you're running too much. Your distance is too far. Maybe you're running too much on pavement. Um, so try to pay attention. So I pay attention to my that one spot on my foot, which I know is sensitive. Inflammation, yes, awesome. So I would think about what are the symptoms of inflammation? Like how do you know that you're starting to get uh, some inflammation? Um, all right, so we've walked through a whole, so if, we, if we'd if we been writing this down, we would uh, have walked through a, um, a full polarity map and you'd have that to kind of 
take and put into your plan for, for how you're going to complete this. Uh, so what we're going to do now is we're going to do a little practice.